been a very, very crappy, crappy week, crappy couple days here in Chicago after that terrible beat down by Kansas City. I don't think many people predicted that as a win, even the people that had – you know them winning 10 11 games i think i think they still had a week 3 loss against Kansas City but i don't think anybody imagined what kind of you know ass whooping they were going to put on us and and how quickly that game was over at halftime and um offense couldn't do anything defense couldn't do anything and it was rough what would you guys what would you guys think about that game well i'm gonna tell you uh, to tell you the truth that game <laughs> i couldn't believe the play call the first play, the first completion was a 15-yard pass. I believe that was the longest completion of the game by field. No, I think I think there was a 26-yard touchdown at the end. But, I mean, you know, into the third quarter, we're looking at 40 passing yards. 15 of them came on the very first play. Getsy notoriously is really good at his first 15, his first 15 scripted plays. It's pretty good about that because I think in that situation, you get to communicate with uh, – different coaches on the coaching staff and get different feedback about what's a good idea versus what's a bad idea. And then once the first 15 are out of the, are off the table, I think you're just watching Getsy at his purest and it's just a hot mess. So yeah, that's Getsy all the time. After the first 15 plays, that's pure Getsy right there. This is a results-based business, right? And the results here are clearly not good. I mean, every, where you want to point a finger at, there's fault, whether it's, you know, uh, the players on the field doing their job, whether it's the coaches coaching them up to be the best they could be or the play calling or, you know, even the defensive coordinator recently resigned. I mean, there's just mess everywhere. On top of it, you know, you're starting to add up more mistakes on Ryan Poles' resume rather than successes. And, you know, we've talked about how even if a GM just hits on 50% of them, he's a good GM. Well, it's starting to kind of lean – a little bit towards the more failure side of things. The first question I have for you guys is if we're truly to believe that, you know, things are going to be different Then the McCaskies need to take their hands off a little bit. And if Kevin Warren is hired to do his job, will the bears fire Matt Eberflus during the season? Could this be the first time in their entire existence that they actually let the president make uh, the choice and cut this thing early, or do they write it out to the end of the year? I think it's not just on Eberflus though. Look at look at the job Ryan Poles did. Ryan Poles was supposed to go out and find this offensive line and this defensive line, and what did he give us? Some of the same crap we had last year. So it didn't. He didn't make a difference on the offense or that defensive line. We still the worst offensive line and still the worst defensive line. <laughs> In the league, how are you going to make a difference? How is a coach, how is even who's going to coach an offensive line, a defensive line, a creative offense, a creative defense with no players that can do it? To answer the question specifically, if Kevin Warren is to be expected to do his job as a team president, this next 10 games is going to be exactly your example of whether or not ownership can overpower a presidency of Kevin Warren. And I have a few tenets in sports that I believe in, and one of the big ones that Paulie doesn't agree with me on is that nothing really changes with your franchise until ownership changes. And I personally big time believe that until ownership changes and the people from the top to the bottom change, nothing's ever really going to change. And he gives me a lot of examples where he's right and it doesn't matter, and I can give him a lot of examples where it does matter. In this specific case, it will tell you everything. Because if Kevin Warren is hired to be team president and he was in charge of a conference in college football that rivals, you know, one specific team in the NFL, like the Big Ten is a is a multi-billion dollar conference, multiple teams and colleges and scholarships and coaches and controversies. This man can run one NFL team. I guarantee it. If his decision is to fire Matt Eberflus and or Ryan Poles by game six or game eight, you need to let him do that. If there's in any way, shape, or form a hint of McCaskey interference and Kevin Warren is not allowed to fire them, then you have a problem that will never go away until the McCaskies go away. Well, the way I look at it is like this. I kind of agree with you. I think the McCaskies got to go. because They never will. Team, I agree with Paulie. They never, never going to go anywhere with them as the owners. They need to sell that team. 
And that's the only way that this team is going to evolve because they are put, they got too much hands on on what's going on. What team have you ever seen in the NFL hires the head coach, then the general manager, then the president of the uh, president of your, your operations? What team does that? Corey, I think you're giving the McCaskies too much credit in the sense that they have some sort of like master plan. They are blind people leading blind people. They truly have no idea what they're doing. And every single time they hire a GM or a coach, they admit to the fact that they don't know what they're doing because they hire an, an old NFL GM or team president to be their, their NFL guy. So let me let me just make my point since it is the opposite of both your points. And you know, the, the McCaskies haven't done anything to deserve anyone standing up for them. So, you know, the, but just as a general, I truly believe that ownership in the NFL, um, that's an obstacle that can be overcome. I mean, you look at a guy like Jim Ursay, as the owner of the Colts, and you know, he had a lot of success. Why? Because he had Peyton Manning. Uh Listen, at some point, I just truly believe you just got to get the right positions in place. And, yeah, you, you should not interfere in football decisions if you don't know what you're doing in football. But that's where, in the past, you know, they had an accountant in Ted Phillips as their team president. So now you go out and hire a football guy to be your team president. I would hope that maybe they start doing things a little bit differently and more hands-off and trust a football guy rather than an accountant because you might as well be making the choices of accountants your president you know what i mean you know and, and like david said i could give you plenty of examples and he could give me plenty of counter examples of where it does matter doesn't matter the colts with jim mercy are just one of them but you know there's plenty of just bad organizations in football until they're not bad anymore um here's here's a quick stat for you guys do you know who the longest the team that has the longest drought for a pro bowl quarterback is that's the Jets. Because I don't have a Jets. No. Or not it. They had one with Brett Favre. Carolina Panthers? Jake DeLone? Nope. nope. Cam Newton. Nope. Would it be the Eagles? No. No, no Eagles. Jalen was last year. Yeah. And I'll give you a clue. Tennessee you know, Titans. Oh, that's a good one. But um, uh, Ryan Tannehill, maybe even. Vince Young went to the Pro Bowl. Probably. Um, the last time this team had a Pro Bowl quarterback was in 1995. Um, technically they might've had him last year, but he couldn't participate, I believe due to injury. And it's not the Browns. No. Um, the Browns probably had it with Baker Mayfield. AFC. AFC it's going to be the AFC East. It's going to be the Dolphins before Tua. It is the Dolphins Tua. before Tua. It is the Dolphins with Dan Marino in 1995. And so the whole point Dan of this Pennington is... Pennington never made a Pro Bowl? Correct. No. no. Wow. Chad Pennington So the point, real quick, that, look, they, they're they rolling now. This looks like a team that might go all the way this year. And you're not good until you're good. And, like, I mean, you don't have to change ownership. What you do is you got to put the right... I believe it starts with mainly the GM down, you know, team president has a lot to do with everything, but you need the right GM. You need the right coach. And then at the end of the day, you need the right quarterback. See, I think here's where I agree with you a lot. And I disagree with you on some, uh, there are plenty of GM and coaching combos that transcend their quarterback. There's plenty that go through quarterbacks left and right. And there's a philosophy behind it where they work together to figure out the next guy. The Eagles, the Niners, the Rams, uh, just to name a few. And they keep turning Steelers. out Steelers. I mean, they just – its it, regardless of where you think it starts, it starts at the GM and it starts at the coach because that means you have a philosophy and an identity. So you bring in guys based on what you want to accomplish. It's, you know, I love the, like, you know, uh, the analogy of, you know, what's a greater number five or one. Right. All right. So you got five people. They're all great. They all know what they're doing, 
but one is going to beat the hell out of five. That might and be the know, cheesiest I, line I've heard you say so no, far. It's a, <laughs> That's no, great. It's a, I love but, it. It's a, <laughs> but he's but he right. But he's, he's still right. coaching. He's still in coach mode right now. And that's the that's the thing. That's why if you're going to hire a head coach, the GM needs to be already in place because he's going to hire the guy that has the same philosophy, the same mind, the same thought process as him. So now they're cohesive. Then that, then that coach is going to get other coaches to follow that mindset that they have. And if you don't have that, if they don't have that, if nobody is – connected in any kind of way like you said you're not going to have anything so for you to say you know is kevin warren hopefully in charge yes i hope that you're right and that i hope that he is but my previous point stands you're going to learn exactly who is still in charge and who is currently in charge in the next five weeks because to directly answer your question absolutely 100% any quality NFL franchise would give almost everyone in that building the boot by week eight. Uh, any quality think, NFL yeah. franchise is going to fire the head coach or fire the offensive coordinator by week eight and put in a skeleton crew and let it ride because that uh, is your level of accountability. So with that being said, you know, draft capital – here by Ryan Poles has been invested into the defense in the last two years. I mean, we did take Darnell right with, you know, um, the first round pick this year, but we're talking about two second round picks in the last two years, all invested into the defense and the defense might've actually gotten worse. I mean, the Jalen Carter thing, you know, they passed on this guy up for character issues and for off the field stuff, but on the field, he's producing. And at the end of the day, for this type of defense and this type of defensive scheme, you need need that three technique position to make this this thing work. And then you know they passed up on it. So with all this stuff being invested to the defense, has the defense actually gotten worse? And because of it, is Brian Pulse on the hot seat himself as well? Brian Pulse should definitely be on the hot seat because look at the way he drafted. He drafted corners. Where is your line help? You went out and got linebackers. Great. Those three up front, those four in the back, beautiful. Love them. But you didn't put nothing in front of them. Where was the draft of putting somebody in front of them? Those linebackers can't do anything if you cannot get push up front. It's too early to tell how bad of a hot seat he is, he's in, but – at this point, you've invested four second-round picks, a third-round pick, and $60 million onto your defense, and you're the 29th or 30th-ranked defense in the league. So I don't care how many years or weeks it takes to gel, that much talent and that much investment is going to get criticized. So your best draft picks in general are going to be Tyreek Stevenson and Jaquan Brisker. Brisker is barely playing. Stevenson looks decent. And then Javon Dexter and Zach Pickens are haven't won a single pass rush attempt this entire season. And we're three games in. So yeah, you're you're doing a bad job. And me and Polly were talking about it today about the guys that we liked as amateur idiots going into the draft and how they are just absolutely dominating on their respective teams. We loved Brian Brzee. We loved Rashi Rice. We loved Dewan Jones. We love Joey Porter Jr. And they went to their own respective teams. And yes, granted, maybe they're in better systems. But these guys are all top five players at their position as rookies. This isn't, this isn't some sort of I want to be the smartest guy in the room competition. Sometimes a good player is just a good player. Don't even start about Jalen Carter because that guy fell into your lap at nine and you wanted to get an extra fourth round pick. Granted, we'll, we'll see how that all works out but he's a top three player in the NFL on the defensive line already in week three. And you could have had him essentially at nine when he's the first overall draft pick. You got to think about it from the Eagles point of view. They look at it as we only had to trade a fourth round pick to move up and get him. <laughs> Guaranteed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that I'll say why well, I'm, I'm out on our You traded that pick. This guy is still 
just not doing anything. You had a decent secondary. Where where was your draft on the line? You had the opportunity to get Jalen Collar, like you said. He gave it away because we don't have, and this this should have told us everything right here when he said this. We don't have the right culture to to help him. That right there should have told us what this year was going to be like. That's a great point because honestly, if you're telling me that <laughs> I can only imagine the dumpster fire of Jalen Carter on top of all of this. His defensive coordinator is quitting midseason and Jalen Carter's three <laughs> games in and he's just like, look, guys, me driving a car fast is the least of your concerns. <laughs> My defensive coordinator is getting raided by the FBI. We go drive 186 <laughs> miles an hour and you guys can shut yeah. the fuck up. Yeah, how are you going to hold me um, accountable to something that you're failing at doing yourself? Right. You and know, and you this is to, to, to elaborate on, on the – the lack of respect is insane. Yeah, that's why nobody yeah, ever nobody the, wants the to stay here. The lack of respect going on in that in that in that locker room right now. You really think about it. you think those guys really have bought in the Eva Flus after all of this mess? You've got twenty four year olds who feel like the grown up in the room. Exactly, and that's the problem. That's the problem. And this is where my doubt of polls comes in, is because now you have to wait for him to say exactly what is the problem and what we're missing. Can he self-analyze what he messed up on, what he did wrong? And it takes a lot longer to fix a mistake as a GM because every move as a GM takes years as opposed to games. As a player, you've got a few amount of games to prove that you're worth something. As a GM, you've got years. My draft won't matter until three years down the line. So now you give him another draft class with another top three picks, and he says, you know what, now I've got it. Well, why didn't you get it the first two times? The Broncos are coming up next. They just got flat out embarrassed. The uh, record for points scored against is 73 points, and Miami handed 70 to them. We're talking about one field goal away from tying the, the all-time record. And, yeah, 70 to 20, just flat out embarrassed. But what's more embarrassing is that – they're a favorite against us next week. What is that? But, but not really. It's not it's after the game. I got in the car. I went for a ride, right? And I put I turned on ESPN and Yurko was on there and he was saying, Listen, he goes, I will lose my mind. Cause I know it's coming. He's like, I know this call is coming, and I will lose my mind on the person that calls in and says, Well, you know what? We outscored the Chiefs in the fourth quarter. <laughs> Ten to nothing. I get home, I hop on, you know, hop on Facebook, and I'm looking at Chicago Bears press conference, and I load it up, and it's Matt Eberflus saying, well, we did some nice things in the fourth quarter that led to a couple turnovers and led to some points on the board. I was like, you got to be I, – I couldn't, I couldn't watch past that. I watched 45 seconds of it and just shut it off. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all um, by, the, uh, by the lines set for this game. In my mind, I think Denver, at the end of the day, is a competent NFL franchise that can comprehend what they do well and what they do not do well. I don't think the Bears have any idea of what they do well and what they don't do well. The Bears you're going to see come out and try the same old, same old. They are very reminiscent of Matt Nagy, Mark Trestman, where they're set on a system, they're set on a foundation of what they believe in, and if they lose, they're going to lose holding on to it. If they win... They're going to win holding on to it. doesn't surprise so, me. And honestly, they deserve to be favored. I, so I think guys, this is going to be a blowout. So what are your guys' predictions? Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to say Denver 35, Chicago 17. They can't get past that 10-17 mark. I'm going to say 27-13 Broncos. And it might not even be that close. It could be 27-10, 27-7. You know, originally when I did my prediction, I had one of these next two games as a win and one of them as a loss. And, I mean, just sticking to my prediction, coming off of what we just came off of, I don't think, uh, I don't think this team finds itself just yet and makes things right. So, yeah, this one's – 
also going to be a loss. I think this team's going to wind up 0 4. Uh, I don't know, 27 10, 27 13, maybe. Um, still just, you know, more than a two touchdown blowout. 